Hi everyone, my name is Cynthia, let's talk books, and today I have a review of a, what I think is a fantastic work of history. It is Before Trans, Three Gender Stories from 19th Century France by Re Rachel Mash. I picked this up for Nonfiction November and I just cannot say enough wonderful things about this book. I teach a cl class on the history of gender and I focus it on Europe because that's my area of specialty. But one of the things that has been missing mm -hmm. in the way I teach it is talking about individuals that did not fit within a gender binary and how um, their lives were shaped by the time period in which they lived and the kinds of gender structures that existed. Um, this book is going to do a lot to help me fill that hole in my class because it does, does such a fabulous job. So uh, let, let's get started with what, what the book argues. And basically it focuses on this period in the 19th century before the term transgender existed. Um, and focuses on three individuals to explore the ways in which they experienced their gender in complex ways. And really starting from the base point of like gender is not the same as sex, right? I always start all my classes on gender that way. Uh, sexual organs have nothing to do with gender identification. Right. Um, and so all three of the writers that Mesh focuses on um, were female, right? And at various times during their lives used male and female pronouns. One of the things that um, kind of brings these people together is all three um, also wore pants. So we're talking about the three writers, Jen de la Foy, Rachel, and Marc de Montifort. Right, so these three writers, and if you have not heard of um, these writers, they you're in for a treat um, reading this book because um, they're really interesting uh, people. So let's start with De La Foy. De La Foy is very interesting because she really seemed to have identified primarily with uh, masculinity and maleness, right? And for her, it a lot of it did begin in her childhood. But more explicitly, it was her experience in the Franco-Prussian War that helped give shape to her masculinity. Um, she went off to the Franco-Prussian War with her husband and during that time wore pants and basically um, lived her life largely as a man. Uh, came back to Paris and uh, went back to wearing dresses during that time, but soon went on an archaeological expedition to Persia. She actually went on several expeditions to Persia in which she again dressed and lived as a man. Uh, what is interesting about Yolafwa is not just that she wore pants, lived and dressed as a man, but that uh, she did not pose a threat to the gender constructs in which she lived. Like really she was breaking a lot of norms, a lot of gender rules of 19th century French society um, by dressing like a man, by having people address her with male pronouns and as a man. But the reason why she didn't, she wasn't a threat to uh, conservative gender ideals was because she kind of, she was a colonialist. She was a colonialist. She went to Persia and behaved as a man within the colonial construct and really did fit the construct of maleness during that period. Um, she did engage a lot with kind of, she was very interested in taking photographs in Persia of kind of effeminate men or men whose um, gender identity would not have been super clear to Europeans. She was very interested in that. So it is clear that she did struggle with um, her gender identity and with defining that. Um, but as I said, it's, it's, her life is complex because there were times in which she lived it as a as female, large chunks of it in which she lived it as male. Um, she was married. Um, her husband um, didn't seem to have a problem with any of this. Um, and they both achieved a lot of success um, during their lifetimes. So um, it's really fascinating story. 
The next writer that Mesh focuses on is Shah Shield, who was extremely famous uh, during this period, uh, famously wore pants as well. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about Rah Shield was that she did not really identify as either male or female. I mean, lived part of her life as a man and part of it as female, but didn't really feel comfortable in either one of those categories. Um, and I think that um, had she lived today, she might be more comfortable within a um, gender fluidity, right? considering herself gender fluid. Uh, Rashid did write a lot about gender. She was clearly exploring her gender identity in her writing. Mm -hmm. A lot of her characters, her main characters, were clearly autobiographical. Um, and so uh, one of the things that Mesh does focus a lot on is the way in which writing created a setting, a venue, through which gender could be explored. Um, the writings of some of these um, authors were controversial at the time, but others were not. And so that's also very interesting. Um, next, um, Mesh focuses on Marc de Monti. Montifo is really interesting because she identified and felt comfortable, it seems like, in both as both a man and a woman, uh, identifying as both at uh, different times, uh, with, used different pronouns, uh, but really seemed attracted more to masculine identity, but didn't completely reject a female body either. Um, let's see, Rashid was also married. She married a man. Montifo was also married to a man, although that seemed to have been a marriage um, that she was not completely interested in. Um, in fact, she was not interested in having sex with her husband. She had sexual relationships with uh, both men and women. Um, so here, once again, like gender identity didn't mean sexual orientation. Um, right, and that is something that um, some of these writers struggled with. Definitely Montifo, uh, for sure. Uh, Montifo um, did not explicitly write about uh, gender, but there are ways in which you can see her work as uh, being a negotiation of, of some of her identity. As she was very interested in publishing and writing about sex. <laughs> very very much and um, and uh, especially like s writing about Catholic saints um, and historical figures that did not clearly fit within a gender binary um, so you do see that in um, in her writing uh, but she didn't write about kind of the struggle of a gender identity in the same way that like Rashid um, did for example. And De La Foy wrote about it more in like private letters and things like that um, and, and you see kind of the struggle with gender identification in other ways. Um, with Montifo it, it's a little bit more subtle but it's definitely there. Um, again one of the things that ties all three authors together is that they all wore pants. They were all visually outside of the gender norms. But the way in which people reacted to them was different, right? Guillefoy was pretty much accepted within conservative circles. Even though she lived part of her life as a male, it was almost like expected and, and excused in a lot of different ways because of the um, colonial element, right? And she did not, Guillefoy did not consider herself a feminist. She was conservative and she did not uh, express feminist views, which is really interesting given how like her, she herself was um, challenging gender norms. Uh, same thing with Rashid, did not really consider herself a feminist. And a lot of it really has to be in which the, has, a lot of that was because of the way French feminism was defined um, in, in the time. Uh, French feminists in the 19th century um, emphasized their femininity and used that to advocate for more rights for women. Um, and because these, these writers did not fit into that category, right, of feminine, then they, there was part of them then that didn't fit that feminist uh, political movement. And yet there were, uh, by challenging gender norms, they, they also had some shared kind of um, cultural and political, uh, they had some sh uh, political and cultural overlap with the feminist movement. 
really really interesting. Um, the main reason why I would highly recommend this book is because it it shows us that there have been individuals and groups throughout history that have not fit the gender ideals of their times and I think studying them and understanding the ways in which they challenge gender norms helps us understand that transgender individuals today in our society are not so like it's not so outrageous, it's not so outside of the norm that um, this has always existed, that um, trans there's a trans history that has not been taught in school, that has not been fully explored by historians, and that there's a lot of room here for really, um, in within the historical uh, feel, uh, within the historical record that can help us um, yeah, this is this is just something that um, that that I think um, does a lot of really good work and has a lot to offer us today. So highly recommended. Um, the other interesting thing that meshed us with this book is really say, you know, these these three individuals. Um, by the way, like I, you might have noticed, I use female pronouns to discuss them. Um, they use different pronouns themselves at different points in their lives, um, and. That that's a really tricky thing for historians, right? Because I don't want to misgender them, but I also don't want to pick pronouns and a gendered identity that they themselves would not have chosen, right? So the language of today, the, the language of transgender and non-binary and gender fluidity, all those terms, all that structural language can help us understand the complex ways in which people challenge gender norms and try to understand themselves but we also should not inflict uh, and force a language upon individuals that they might not have chosen for themselves right that's why i used female pronouns for the same reason that mesh uses them and she discusses that in the book um, that they the female pronouns were, 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 were primarily used for these three authors and they're not alive today. They don't they didn't have the same kind of wider choices to discuss their gender identity uh, in terms of language that we have today. Um, and so it's not fair to pick that language for them. Right? We can take educated guesses on what language they would have used uh, for themselves, but we cannot make those choices for them. Um, and so um, that that's why I kind of use the pronouns that I did um, and 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 really want to be careful about that. And so uh, so that is it for me. Let me know if you are interested in these stories. If you are interested in the book, if you have any questions at all, leave them down below. Um, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.